Hey guys, Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast. And in this episode, we get to speak to John Shea from No Shame Income. Now, John is a self-made entrepreneur who started out in the MLM game and converted to working for a digital marketing agency where he learned so much about digital marketing and SEO, he applied that skills and went out on his, on his own and starting his own agency and teaching other people to grow the agency. So through this episode, John and I talk about the power of doing really good keyword research and how important that is to make sure we get great traffic to our sites and how to turn that into income. We also talk about how to get VAs to do this and automate that process, kind of like the 80-20 rule, so we can be spending more time on more important tasks in our life and in our business. Now, the really cool thing that we talked about in this episode is the one thing principle. And how to ensure we don't get blinded by the shiny object syndrome when we run a business trying to grow it. So if you're looking to buy a website business and grow it to get the most out of it and achieve your lifestyle goals, this is a great episode to watch. So, hey, John, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. So grateful to have you here because I've went through some of the accolades that you've you've had and, and some of the people that you've spoken to uh, and you've interviewed, just for everybody listening, he's interviewed some big names here um, and has started in working in an online marketing agency and is now you've mainly helped people grow their blogs and their website businesses with good SEO and digital marketing. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So your entrepreneurial journey started pretty similar to me is uh, you went into the MLM space and that's how I got started as well. How did you find, because everybody's, I, I noticed a lot of people sort of get started with the MLM and then they work their way into something that's more suited for them. How did you make that transition from MLM to, to this? Yeah, I guess I could give a brief on my, my sort of story and background and that way people have some context. Yeah, um, that'd be great. You know, when I first got started, I was, yeah, I mean, for me, it was, um, I was interested in uh, back in early 2000s, there was a program called P90X and I was doing that a lot and I had had some good results at the time and basically decided to join an MLM opportunity that they had. Um, I had gone to an event where it was like a fitness event. You do like yoga and workouts with like hundreds of people outdoors. And it was really exciting. And um, I ended up joining that as an opportunity. And for a couple of years, I tried to sell their products. But I really wasn't reaching a whole lot of people outside of like my current, um, you know, coworkers and things like that and friends and family. And I just had a really hard time selling the products. They would sell like, you know, $130 like workout shake uh, for a month supply. And it was like, the times I would sell it, the people would, you know, keep a month's supply for three months and they didn't need the recurring stuff as much as what, you know, it was intended to be sold as. And I just had a really hard time um, being able to sell the workout programs and get any real consistent income out of it. Um, but I continued to do it because they had, you know, discounts on their products and services. So what I ended up eventually doing was one of the guys that was in that introduced me to sort of a similar multi-level marketing um, thing where he was making money online with a blog. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, the idea of being able to make money on the internet with a blog. So I got kind of hooked on this whole thing and sort of went down this crazy journey over the next couple of years where it was really the first year I just sort of dabbled around and was trying these different things. Eventually I started a podcast and I did that for about two years. Um, the problem with my podcast was I interviewed a lot of cool people and had some good relationships, even business partnerships out of it. But ultimately I wasn't making a lot of income from the podcast directly. Uh, throughout all of that, I started learning about digital marketing and <clears throat> search engine optimization and um, really got intrigued by the idea of going out and working with a business and, you know, say charging them a monthly fee for say SEO or for website design. And um, I started doing that a lot more. Eventually um, was still working full-time jobs. I even worked for an agency for a little while and eventually said, you know what, I could do this on my own. And all throughout doing this over the last few years, I started from all the things that I was learning online, I started teaching other people the things that I had been learning. So one of my most successful courses is actually a course on showing other people how they could go start their own digital agency and uh, go out there and you know start offering similar services like web design and SEO and um, all, of the, all of the above, really. 
Awesome, man. And I was so similar to you that I went and started blogging. Like I went through that. I didn't do anything in between my MLM and, and when I was just working my regular job as a plumber and I got hooked on blogging and I was just like, I wanted the dream life of traveling around the world and making money online. And I just got hooked and I tried so yeah. hard to make money from my blog, but just everybody was doing it. And it was just, I found it really hard because it's, everybody in the travel industry was just taking like little minute pieces out of the, like the big pie. And it was just hard for anybody to get really established in that, in that game. And um, you went off and you decided to start working with other agencies and then you did so well, you started your own pretty much when people, Yep. Like most, most of the people who listen to this podcast is they're buying a business and they want to grow it as well. So people that come to you say they've bought a business or they've already got one established. What are some of the things that you guys would first look at when people come and like, Hey, I want to do some marketing or some SEO. What should we do with it? What are some of the first steps you take or first things that you look at? Um, I mean, really for any of the SEO campaigns that I've typically done, uh, both for clients or even just looking at my own stuff, it probably just comes down to spending a lot of time on like that base foundation of probably doing an audit of the site, um, putting a lot of emphasis into keyword research and really just looking at, you know, where, where are things at, right? Especially if they're buying a site, where is it at now? And then uh, where, you know, what's the potential that this, this site could be doing in terms of search traffic, uh, keyword research that is going to emphasize it, have some kind of buyer intent behind it and um, doing a lot of that. Now, I mean, I purchased a site at one point. It wasn't a lot. I think it was $500, but it had a good domain. The branding was good. Um, it had a really good design, but it was very much lacking in content. It had a lot of just content that was sort of um, taken from like generic articles that you could find like like basically PLR type content. Yeah. And um, I went out and the first thing that I did with that site, just I'll use this as an example. Um, I just did a ton of keyword research, right? I, I figured out, um, you know, how could I find like this kind of low hanging fruit keywords that I knew would have some competition, but it would be something that I could publish. It would get enough search volume that I could bring in visitors. And if they went through those articles, they would likely end up buying affiliate products through Amazon. So it's like an Amazon affiliate site. I know it's very common for people to sell those if you're on marketplaces or buying sites. And um, I went out and I had all these articles written and some of them didn't do great, but others ended up doing really well. In fact, I have one article I think is responsible alone for like well into like thousands of dollars. And that article I paid someone on Fiverr like $5 to write. Um, eventually it was revised, but um, it was crazy to think that, you know, just spending that extra time to really do that research um, was what made all the difference, right? So people were seeking a solution to a specific problem. They would find me through that keyword that I did the research on, end up reading the article and then buying the products that I recommended. Yeah. And would you say, I agree, keyword research is so important because you could just slap out 10 articles or 10 posts um, with average or reasonable keywords. And from those 10, you yep. could spend your time focusing on one and finding one really good keyword and write one really good post and get even more traffic from that. So would you say that um, how much time would you spend finding these keywords and then how much time would you spend writing the content or you'd probably get somebody else to do it where else where like the time spent for keyword research is my question, but also Whereabouts do you go and, and search for your keywords? You, you have certain tools like, uh, you know, Google keyword research. Yeah. Tool, or do you have any paid ones that people may want to use? Yeah. So what I used and the one that I would recommend would be Longtail Pro. That's a really good one for basic, basic keyword research. They have like their own algorithms that they use to decide how competitive a particular keyword is. So if you find keywords that have basically that buyer intent, right? Like they're going to lead to the opportunity for you to promote a product or promote something that you're selling um, combined with that low competitive score um, as well as being combined with the fact that there's people actually searching for it um, even to some extent, right? Like it could be even a few hundred searches a month. Um, those compounded together, you know, if you had 10 or 20 articles that were doing that, that's going to add up to thousands of potential visitors. 
Um, and of course, there'll be other long tail variations that could that article could be found for. Um, I'm thinking back to when I did this site because it was years ago. I remember spending quite a bit of time on the keyword research. I basically did a Google Drive doc and just um, compiled these together based on categories. So you know, broken them down like maybe this one was kind of fit into this category, these fit into another category, and then I split them out and figure out what's um, you know what's ultimately going to um, be the easier kind of low-hanging fruit keywords. And then I would go out and find writers to actually write content and make sure, kind of vet them, uh, maybe have them write a trial piece or do one initial article and just see how they do. If it comes out to be something that, you know, is eligible, is very good in terms of the content and how it was put together, then I would just do more of that content. Um, then the bigger, like, long-term play is obviously starting to do uh, backlinks and getting, you know, doing guest posts and all the other things needed to get the SEO really moving on the site. Um, these days I'll say that more of the work I'm doing is much more client focused and I'm probably spending a lot more time involved in like the sales process and relationship process. Um, I'm not particularly buying a lot of sites myself, so I know your audience is very much doing that, but this could sort of apply is that, um, you know, you might buy this business, right? Maybe you're interested in whatever it is you, you just pick up. You, probably have some interest in it. It's not just all about the money or what it's producing because yeah. clearly you might not want to work on something if you don't have any interest in it at all. Um, so really what I've done is I spent a lot more time trying to develop relationships with people that are, they know more about these things than I do. Right? So when I first started with like local SEO, for example, that was something I got into because it was generally catered as somewhat easier than national sites trying to rank all over the country. I would read all these articles and pick up all these things. And that's where I learned a lot of these things like keyword research and so on and so forth. But what I ended up kind of realizing in my own mind was that there's a lot of people that have spent much more time learning about these things or much more time figuring out processes around how they do these things. Mm. And I just developed relationships with them. And um, most of my client work, I basically bring on as partnerships. Um, in terms of affiliate sites, I mean, it's really just going to come down to, you know, in buying sites that you're working on as your own entity, it's probably coming down to just spending enough time to understand the basics and at the same time being able to go out there and know that, you know, if you're paying someone to say do backlinks or content or keyword research or whatever it is, that you know you're getting your money's worth and that you're going to get, you know, something out of that, right? Um, it's kind of one of those things like I talked to a mortgage guy earlier today, actually he emailed me and he was like, yeah, I'm trying to use SEO power suite, the rank tracker. And he thought that that was used for keyword research. And I got on the phone with him, you know, I had time and I said, you know, um, you probably need long tail pro like SEO power suite rank tracker is for tracking your rankings. And you know, he didn't know the difference. Like he's just trying to figure all this stuff out. And I, I said to him, I, I said, look, you know, you're trying to run your business. You're trying to build your mortgage company and you know, work with clients to sell them a mortgage, refinance their mortgage. You shouldn't be spending all your time trying to SEO your website and learn this whole new trait. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, like, you know, he's able to kind of pick and pull little pieces in, right? Like maybe he could write blog posts if he knew the right keywords to go after. And then maybe he's got the SEO guys doing like guest posts or other things that are going to take up a lot more significant amount of time. Yeah, that's so, focusing. Um, that's really kind of how I look at it. Okay. Yeah. So that's focusing him. He's really focusing on the 20% rather than the 80% rule, right? By knowing like if he exactly. just goes away and focuses on that, that small amount of work that he has to do with writing the content and have somebody else get the keyword research right or something like that, there's a better approach for a business owner. And I feel that's the same. And that's why I have my community is people are, going around and trying to buy websites and they're trying, they're struggling through all these different tools and all these different things they hear about how to do due diligence. And they just don't know like what's the right approach and it can end up putting them in a spin and allowing them to not allowing them, but projecting them to have a longer time frame between them learning the process and owning a business and then even they can get bad results which can put them back even further and it's the same with the people this mortgage or finance broker guy who's looking at doing seo he could do seo that maybe black hat and put him back even further so that's why like for everybody listening i think it's really important to hear out like the guests that we have on the show like john's because you can cut your learning down 
and you can get better results by doing so. And with your backlinking, I noticed you said you do some, some backlinking and, and you work on that sort of stuff. Is that something that you're finding the backlinks yourself for your client or you hiring somebody to do so? How does that work? Yeah, so depending on the client, um, a lot of my local clients, usually what we do as an example is we come up with a budget that we put towards the link building. So, I mean, this could be something if you're doing SEO for a site that you own, you would just kind of deviate it in the same ways that you have a budget for that. Um, I really look at it one of two ways. Either you're going out there and acquiring links manually, which is a very tedious process and can be automated to some extent, or two, you're straight up just buying links. Um, some links, there's no way to get them without buying them, right? Like if you wanted a link on bestoftheweb.org, which is like a very authoritative, basically an ancient website that's been around, has massive authority. I think you're gonna pay like 150 some odd dollars to get that placement, right? So that's a link that you're gonna to have to pay for, but it's still gonna benefit you in a great way. Similarly, for local clients, we might go get them listed on the Chamber of Commerce. That could cost over $300, but that's the only way to get it. Um, so those are the types of links I might pay for. Um, again, you could pay for guest posts and other things of that nature, but um, if you really wanted to build and kind of systemize the process, I would probably look at it as a project management sort of scope where you would go out and maybe hire um, a writer. You have a person that's doing outreach and finding um, basically sources of where you could get your articles listed. So let's just say you did, um, I had a client that did e-commerce photography, right? He took photos of products that were being sold on the internet. So we went out and had one person find a list of sites that were in the Amazon niche because Amazon is e-commerce, right? So anybody selling on Amazon has products that need photos taken of them. So it's kind of a, a relevant enough that we could find all these sources of where people are talking about Amazon, Amazon FBA, and so on and so forth. So what we did is we had one person go out and build that list, right? They found a hundred websites that are related to this niche. And then what we did is had a second person go out and actually send emails to them and have follow-up emails um, up to as many as like three times saying, hey, we have this guest post idea. Would you be interested in doing it? And then they're following up with that list and kind of managing the list that the other person had discovered. And then we had a third person that once those articles were accepted, we would then um, have an actual article written as a guest post for them, which would include a link back to said website. So imagine if you were doing all this yourself, right? You're trying to write the articles, you're trying to find the sites, you're trying to email the sites. Um, while you could use some tools and things to automate this, um, it'd be better that you were kind of the overseer, like the project manager of that project, and you could automate this by simply hiring people, um, you know, those outreach people, you could get on Upwork for literally probably um, four to $7 an hour. And um, they could probably do quite a bit in a short period of time that you could otherwise be spending on other things that are going to produce you more revenue for your business. Yeah. I think it's a, it's, and that's a great approach is for people that are like, maybe have a, 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 a business or a website that they're growing and then they have a job. Like a lot of my clients are, they're wanting to get out of the, the nine to five. There's a big chunk of them. Some of them already have businesses, but want to buy, but a big chunk want to just get out of that, rat race type thing. So I totally agree with you in the sense that if you have a job and you're making say $50 an hour or a little bit more or a little bit less, and then you've got your business, is it worth you spending all of that time to make that happen? Which is going to, you could do maybe two hours, three hours, maybe four hours of work to pay somebody to do all of that for you. And you've just saved yourself yep. so much time. And plus, you're going to get better results as well. And this is the top, this is the power of using VAs and and good systems. And that's something that you've you've been you teach that sort of stuff a little bit, John, to your clients on how to get that sort of stuff happening. For sure. And, um, yeah, I mean, I even um, I have a software tool that I even developed kind of around the same concept. It's similar to Trello, but it's more about you know finding and hiring people to do a lot of these things for you. So I'll give an example of something that recently was stressing me out. So. As of this year, I decided to focus a lot of my energy on growing my YouTube channel. Um, I just recently passed a couple thousand subscribers, so it's kind of an exciting milestone. Congrats, man. But I had a friend of mine, yeah, he friend of mine, he had started out, um, he had kind of had a channel lingering at 8,000 subscribers, but what really didn't do anything with it for some time. And he decided to focus on it like crazy, and he's now over 200,000 subscribers. So I've kind of been able to get um, his guidance really for free as a friend. 
um, is someone that's come to me and said, hey, you know, here are the things that you could do to grow like I have, right? So I took everything he told me to do and I started spending all the time doing this stuff and I was going as far as literally learning how to use Photoshop so I could edit my own thumbnails. Uh, <laughs> I had to spend time learning how to use Camtasia, edit the videos, right? And these are all skills that um, it was important for me to learn them and understand them. Um, but what I found was that I was getting burned out really quickly, right? If I was doing three videos a week, I have to come up with a video topic. I have to record the video, make sure that I don't make screw ups. And then at the same time, I also had to create that thumbnail. Um, I also had to make edits to the video, add music, add an intro, add an outro, add all the different things, right? And then in addition to that, uploading the video, writing the description, doing the tagging, doing the title uh, is a ton of work. So what I did is I went on Upwork and I hired a VA to take off about half that workload. I have a VA that literally, I record a video, I don't do any editing, I send that to them through Google Drive and then they do all the editing, they add the music, they add all the content to it, the edits, my social media links pop in, the, you know, I'll tell people, hey, give me a thumbs up, go subscribe to the channel and there's little like things that he'll add to the video that make it cool and add effects. And in addition to that, he does my thumbnails for me. So he'll take, I gave him like 10 templates and he'll kind of mix and match them and then get those edits done. So I pay him, I think about $42 a week and he'll do about three videos for that. So give or take your, you know, spending a little over, you know, roughly like $15 for each video. Um, but that is saving me so much time. And I was recently looking at my channel and noticed that just from having ad revenue turned on with YouTube, I'm earning almost near $200 just from the ad revenue. So I'm actually growing my channel and that's almost kind of paying for that VA and it's saving me a massive, massive amount of time um, that otherwise I just, you know, if I was doing all those edits and all that other stuff, I couldn't really focus on the things I want to be doing, which is creating more YouTube content. Yeah, that's, I totally agree with in that sense. So when people realize that they can spend their money, they like, even if they have a job, they can spend their money getting other people to do the work for them and it can just grow and then eventually it grows to a certain point where it's making, you know, you $200, it's kind of paying for the, it's paying for the tasks that get done. But what's happening is you're building what people don't realize is like, I may not be actually making money or net profiting from it, but you're building something that's way more important, which is an asset. And that asset is your channel. And you can leverage that with, you know, if you want to help, people sell your course or whatever it is, you know, help people by selling your course. And it's the same with, with uh, my podcast. Like I don't do, I record a podcast, upload it to G drive and then it gets everything else is done for me editing all that sort of stuff because I don't have, to, I don't even know how to edit a podcast. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know how to post it on and get it like ranked in all these different um like Spotify and I, I got no idea because I, I'm better off just right, right. Focusing on recording really good content and getting great guests like you, because by doing so that builds me an asset and I can leverage that. Like I was saying before. So if everybody listening is like, when you're building, I guess the biggest theme here, John, is that when they're building a business or they buy a business and when they're building it is to, not get discouraged by spending a little bit of time and a little bit of money on building it and not getting a massive return back straight away because eventually you'll be able to leverage off it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of like, like, you know, for me, it's figuring out, you know, where is your time best well spent, you know, and if you're trying to go out there and learn all these different skills, I mean, you know, again, I'll bring back like this mortgage guy as an example, just cause it's fresh in my mind. You know, he said to me, he goes, oh, I'm doing, I'm going to, you know, run Facebook ads and we got Google ads and we're going to go do a chat bot and I'm doing the keyword research and I'm doing blogs and I'm thinking to myself, like, when are you going to have time to run your actual business, you know? And um, that's like the biggest, I think one big thing for me as well that um, it may just be helpful for a lot of those people out there maybe that are getting started with this stuff. You know, I know buying an asset, right? It's kind of like a shortcut, you know, you're getting something that already is producing some money. Um, I found that it can be quite easy to, especially in the entrepreneur space, just be sort of jumping around all over the place. There's shiny objects, there's literally ads being thrown at you left and right every single day, whether or not you're on YouTube or Facebook. Um, you're basically being inundated with other people showing you this other cool thing, right? And even buying, it, like you could go out right now and spend thousands of dollars on a website that let's say it's producing, let's just say it's making a thousand dollars a month. That's pretty exciting, but you may see something that makes it seem like 
the grass is greener on the other side. Like you're going to go do this other thing and it's going to make me way more money than that thousand dollar website. And maybe you have that site and you're, you're spending that time on it, but you could still be somewhat intrigued by that other thing because that thousand dollars just isn't quite enough to get you out of your day job. Right. Um, I found for myself, uh, I recently started doing uh, a lot of accountability with people. Right. So I assigned myself three goals every week for the things that I want to get done. And I assign the days that I'm going to work on those three things. And I kind of combine that between lifestyle and business. So there may be areas, you know, if you're lacking in say like your life, maybe you're waking up late in the day. Um, you know, you're not eating properly, uh, just different things that could be hindering you in your business. That's obviously going to not help. So I like to come up with goals that are based around that. So I have an accountability partner that I tell them, Hey, Every week, I'm going to wake up every day at 7.30 in the morning, and then that way, I have some reason to actually be there, and someone's kind of holding me accountable to that. Um, and then in addition to that, I come up with like one or two things that I'm going to work on. So right now, for me, um, I'm really focused on trying to build my YouTube channel and promote one of my online programs. So really, every week, I say, hey, I'm going to produce three more YouTube videos. And I've been able to do that for the last um, probably, I don't know, three months or so. And I think I'm up to like, I, I think I just did like my 25th video since I started doing this. So that's kind of exciting, right? That's like almost doing a video a day. Um, if you added it up over time, it's quite a bit of content. And uh, I just think having that accountability is so, so important for entrepreneurs because of the fact that there's so many distractions and just so much going on. It's easy, especially if you're trying to figure out some of this stuff on your own, it's really, really easy to just get caught in this loophole. Um, I mean, you could spend, you know, all, all of your time just trying to figure out how do I do this keyword research thing? And you could go look at all these tools and read reviews and try them out and sign up for trials and do all these different things, right? And you're now in this loophole where you're reading all these articles and you're falling basically down and down that loophole. And um, yeah, it just, it can become kind of dangerous if you don't, if you let it. So that was what happened to me for a lot of years. And it really just hurt my growth. Like I think I would be so much further ahead had I really had some accountability and at the same time was a lot more focused on where I wanted to be, right? I know yeah. if you just bought a website, you know, I'm thinking this in my own mind, if you had bought a website, right? Like you really have to kind of go into it with the mentality that like you're all in on this and like this is the thing that you're working on and focused on and that's what's going to allow you to quit your job and that's going to be the business that you run and that you're not going to be over here on the side like trying to get some SEO clients or do this other thing or whatever it is. Um, start a blog, you know, start a podcast, do a million different things. Cause you're just going to have slow progress everywhere you go. Yeah. Wow. I'm so glad you just brought all of that into the show because this is what I work with my clients on is that when you've bought a business, let's work out what is, there's a, there's books written on this stuff. It's, it's the one thing it's a yellow cover. It's just called the one thing. Um, it's an international bestseller. I've read it and what we do is once somebody's bought a business, we go, all right, cool. What are the leverage points that we can work on? What's low hanging fruit? Let's tick one off at a time. Let's not try and just get overwhelmed because people buy a business and they go, oh, wow, I've got to do all this stuff. And it's so scary. And then they mm. try and they stress themselves out to get on top of it. And then they just build more and more and more. And they get in this vicious circle of just trying to do everything at once. And, I feel that if you can combo what you have, I also have this with a, with a buddy as well as an accountability partner, but if you have your accountability partner hold you accountable to just one task until it's complete and you tell them what a complete looks like, they will hold you accountable to finishing that task or working on that for a certain date or until you achieve a certain goal with it, like your YouTube channel gets to X amount of subscribers if you start putting things on your list, like I'm going to do this today and this, this week, then your accountability partner should be whipping you and going, no, you're not. You're going to go back to the task because otherwise you're going to, you're just going to deviate and not get progress. Right. So I'm so glad that you brought that up because what, like if you focus on too many, it's like the person who tries to catch like two rabbits ends up catching none because they, you just mm. can't do it at the same time. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Yep. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Like you've, you've just dropped some absolute awesome knowledge, especially all the way through keyword research to backlinking and then really 
refining down like what we need to do as business owners and not just in business but in life if like we're trying to focus on our health as well like let's be consistent by getting up at 7 30 every morning and have somebody hold us accountable to that because if we're not healthy our business can't be healthy and it starts within us right so yeah i'm so glad you brought yep. all that into the show john and so where can people find out more about what you're actually doing because you're doing some great stuff yeah i would say um probably best bet would be to check out my youtube channel i mean again i've kind of stopped blogging i've stopped doing a lot of other things um and i've just been really focused on trying to grow my youtube channel so that's where i'm putting the bulk of my content at the moment i don't even go on facebook anymore i literally like blocked it entirely um i i pretty much am on youtube right now so i would say that's going to be the best place to go to find me excellent and i have a little um i was going to add this in i have a little combat tool that i use to get to not use facebook or instagram or anything like that and what i realized is like i found out the times i would tend to be i would get my addiction hit from these from these apps is what i would do is i downloaded a brainwave app or a brain training app and I know I consciously caught myself if I went to go to one of these social media apps, I would go, no, 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 I have to replace that with something else. And I'd go to the brain train one. And eventually I got over the brain train one, but in doing so it helped me eliminate those distractions. So I'm glad that you brought that up too as hmm. well. So um, look, we talked about uh, what we do if we bought a business and, and grow it. What we didn't talk about was making sure we find a good business to buy. Guys, the guys that are listening, I have free resources that teach you how to buy websites safely with due diligence tools and frameworks and website evaluated tools and all that sort of stuff. So don't just rush out and buy something and then have like have to focus on some like really changing something around that's going downhill because you bought a lemon. So uh, that's something I just wanted to add in there. Do you agree with that, John? Like you can spend all this time doing the growth part, but if you, if you don't do the correct planning and due diligence by buying a lemon, then it just makes it so much harder, right? Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you really have to spend the time. I mean, think of it as like if you were going out to buy a car, right? You're about to spend a lot of money. So you're probably going to do quite a bit of research. You're going to want to test drive it, you know, all the different things that you really you know, you're not going to just make this split decision, um, you know, unless it's maybe a brand new car, you're probably buying in a lot of cases. I know many people are just spending a lot of time to do that initial research. I do the same thing every time I buy any products on Amazon, you know, you read the reviews, you try to understand, um, is this a good decision, right? Um, I know even recently like, I did something a little off base. I just finished a remodeling project we were talking before. And I had been told by my neighbor that I shouldn't do normal tile. Like tile is very nice looking, but of course you deal with the grout, right? So the grout can get kind of nasty over time. It can be not appealing to clean and things like that. And I had dealt with that in a kitchen environment. So I thought to myself, is there other solutions? So I did a ton of research and I looked at what are my options instead of doing this, I want this nice new bathroom like surround. I want something that looks cool. And I found a product that basically was designed to be used in a shower that didn't have the grout. And I read all the reviews about it. I watched all the videos on YouTube. I spent all the time learning would this product be good. And it was a, granted, it was a $500 purchase. I still wanted to be confident that I wasn't going to have water damage in my home by going with this other product that really wasn't like the norm, you know? So spending that time to just do that research on really, I mean, I do it with products I buy, with cars, buying a website, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, yeah. spend that extra time and you're going to find it to be well worth it in the long run. Yeah, that plan is, is so key. Thank you so much for jumping on. I'm going to put your links in the show notes for everybody listening. Please go away and like and subscribe. And also don't just go away and hit the buttons and subscribe and like and all that sort of stuff. But where, whilst you're there, please leave a review. And the reason I want you to leave a review is so you can give me feedback on the podcast and I can, that allows me to bring more guests like John to the show to ensure that you guys are actually getting value from this. So I want to know, please share that with me by leaving a little review and um, I'll speak to you guys soon. Thanks, John.